The takeaway, what do I want you guys to know at the end of this session? Better understanding of why we ask the questions we do or will. We being the auditors, the questions that we do or we will. Secondly, characteristics of well-supported judgments with a good quote here and estimates and what uh, the characteristics of good disclosure. So first of all, why we do the things we do. I asked Craig Jackson, one of our principals, and he, I said, you know, what's new? What's new with estimates and judgments? And he said, well, you know, it has a 540, more shells. So I, what, do you, what do you mean, shall? I know I didn't read CAS 540. I, you know, I, I really wanted to. But Craig just gave me the Reader's Digest version, so here it is. And he said, well, shalls, the more shall, uh, it means the more stuff you have to do. And uh, so I looked up, and actually this font is called the uh, Helvetia New Testament font. So, you know, like shall, the biblical kind of perspective there. So somehow this stuff is delivered, right? And, and, and the, wherever the CAS people are, they walk in one day, there is, it's the flaming computer, thou shall do something, right? So here we have this new, this new CAS 540 accounting estimates. A couple things. Thou shalt, uh, when testing an estimate, uh, consider audit procedures to uh, obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, of course, but relating to selection of methods, assumptions and data, and how point estimates were selected. Now, in the context of my little bubble, valuation, purchase price allocations, impairment, I encounter this all the time. So I thought, well, you know what, maybe I can actually talk a bit about this and give you folks some useful information. CAS 540 goes on to talk about significant assumptions, specifically the necessity of the audit folk uh, to uh, get some evidence with respect to whether assumptions are appropriate in the context of financial reporting, uh, whether they give rise to indicators of possible management bias. And that's quite interesting, bias. What is bias, right? Bias is just systematic error. Uh, so bias doesn't mean, well, you know, we, we wish that this number is higher, we want it to be higher, therefore uh, we're biased in that sense. No. Bias might just be a, 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 a systematic error. So for example, to the extent that in preparing estimates, one consistently overlooks the low end or doesn't express things in a range, that might by itself be a bias. And one of the comments I have when I frequently look at management working papers on impairment testing and things like that is, but where's the range? Why not give a range? Now, putting a range down on a piece of paper doesn't mean that the lower end of your range indicates a, a, a point that you have to write things down to. No, it's simply the information prepare the range, and then prepare some narrative explaining why the lower end of the range isn't applicable. That by itself will give the appearance of a lack of bias. Uh, significant assumptions, once again, the audit folk responsible for <coughs> ensuring that uh, those assumptions are consistent, consistently applied throughout the various components of the financial statements. Let's look at things like, a um, simple example, a margin, a profit margin. So a profit margin used in the context of uh, valuing an intangible asset, is it the same profit margin that's used in the context of a goodwill impairment test? Is it or is it not? Should it be? Should it not be? At the very least, have a narrative to show people that, in fact, you've considered it. Now, the people would be myself. So effectively, the client would give something to Guy. Guy would pass it on to me, and Guy would say, Mark, can you please take a look at the client's working papers and see whether or not there is sufficient appropriate audit evidence from your perspective, from the evaluator's perspective, to support these assertions? Once again, a narrative. When I see a narrative, the heavens open up, okay? In fact, one of our clients, I won't identify him, gave me just a wonderful working paper a couple months ago. There was three sentences there. I read it. It was like, oh, ah. I had to sit back. I wanted to grab a cigarette. It was that good, okay? It was so <laughs> incredibly refreshing. Because here's what it said. Here's what the issue is. Here's what I considered. Here's a couple options. And this is why I selected this one. Wow. That's amazing. That was good stuff. Anyways. And a last thing, you know, a very important thing here, which, which is often overlooked. <coughs> Assumptions regarding whether management has the intent to carry out the course of action or the capability, the capacity to do so. Good question, or a good example. About uh, six months ago, I had a working paper that was prepared. Now, this was a pretty amazing business, okay? The projection went from zero to $500 million in sales in three years, you know, 
Now that's that's pretty impressive growth, right? Pretty impressive growth. So of course I looked at it once again. So how could you possibly do this? Did you have the capacity to grow from zero to five hundred million dollars in sales? So that you know that's a silly example, but it certainly it certainly illustrates this concept of really how are you going to finance five hundred million dollars in growth? So that's the kind of thing, when we look at that, management has the intent to carry out the course and the capability or capacity to do so. So CAS 540, interesting stuff. <coughs> One of the reasons why we ask the questions we do or will. Moving on, what about judgments and estimates? A great read, okay? Bowen Island last weekend, little b and I was there, and I had IAS1. What an incredibly riveting piece of literature that is. <laughs> Okay, particularly, particularly now. Of course, a guy mentioned a couple, uh, a couple of paragraphs there. Ah, that stuff's okay. Okay, paragraph 122 and paragraph 125, that's the good stuff, okay? 122 talks about judgments. Is it here? Lo and behold, it's there. Requires disclosures of judgments apart from those involving estimates that management has made in applying accounting policies. Then you skip to 123 and 124. 125 comes up and says, oh, we need information regarding the assumptions the entity makes about the future and other significant sources of estimation uncertainty. So judgments under IAS 1.122, estimates IAS 1.125, okay? Interesting, what's the difference? Now it's not that a judgment requires judgment and an estimate doesn't. It's simply that 122 excludes any judgments involving estimates. Very simple, very simple. Moving on to the good stuff though. When we're talking about judgments and estimates, it's important to sort of expend the right degree of effort, okay? And basically, as, as it mentions here, only the most complex or subjective ones, not oh, some good tunes, so heavy metal. <laughs> Is that a heavy metal ring tune? That's, that's a ringtone, eh? That's, that's great, back to black, eh? That's a, that, 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 that's a classic, yeah. Okay, so there have been requests, both from, uh, both from uh, Mr. Block back there. So yes, I was, 20 years ago, I was a rock star. I've played, I've played all the Coliseums. I was with uh, Colin James and the Powder Blues, and I'm, my songs are still on the radio. So by popular request next time, I will have a video clip of one of the first MTV videos I did in my red spandex, okay? <laughs> There you go, okay, no, and, and the, the, the air, there'll be some, there'll, there'll be a, the blurried effects and don't worry, Pete, I won't, I miss. there you go. So anytime you hear five long years on the radio or why you lie, those powder blues, or the Colin James songs are powder blues uh, doing it right, that, that is me playing way back when, okay, many years ago, way too many years ago. And then I became an accountant. Yeah, yeah, judgment. Judgment. <laughs> you got it. Okay, <laughs> common judgments. So here's common judgments we all see. Useful life and depreciation, functional currency, convertible notes, impairment, business combinations. That's fine, okay? How do you support judgments? Document them. Demonstrate you understand the facts. Describe the process. Describe why it's common to the industry. Discuss the alternatives considered, okay? Very, very important, once again, just document, demonstrate, have a story, and demonstrate that you understand things, that you've gone through the process. This is why this particular transaction constitutes an asset acquisition rather than a business combination. The narrative carries you a long way. And once again, watch how you expend your efforts. Only the most complex issues should be dealt with. And, uh, well, we have a subliminal message in there. How did that pop in, once again? So my subliminal message, Document, demonstrate, detail, describe, and discuss. This will always do you well. Let's look at estimates. Our common estimates, biological assets, share-based comp, fair, ba uh, fair value financial instruments, and purchase price allocations. And this is a good spot to insert my pithy, pithy quote. So a fellow by the name of Dagobert Runes. Any Dagoberts in the audience? <laughs> Dags, Dags, Daggies, Dago, Dagoberts, no? Anyways, he was a, a famous Ukrainian philosopher, born in 1902, and this was his, his pithy quote, hesitancy in judgment is the true mark of the thinker. Hesitancy in judgment is the true mark of the thinker. 
what a great quote. Okay, now actually they were just his friends were getting him to, to hurry up when he was ordering his lunch at that point, and he said, hey, hesitate, you know. But n nonetheless, think about it. A fast judgment is probably a not a supported judgment, a very well supported a judgment. So go back to that. Hesitating judgment is the true mark of the thinker. Moving on to estimates, very quickly, because I only got a couple minutes left here. Our common estimates, and a couple of them are asterisks, because these are the ones I don't want you guys to forget about. Revenues and costs, okay, those are, those are obviously estimates that can be supported by, by way of tying things into historical and, uh, you know, historical uh, revenues, historical costs, historical margins. Things that are commonly forgotten are things like taxes and working capital and capital expenditures. And I'm thinking about this. So think about my, my client from last year with growth from zero to 500,000 or 500 million dollars. And by the way, they were a retail type operation. How much working capital do you think they need to inject into the company to actually attain that? Aside from all the other, all the other uh, difficulties. Once again, make sure that your estimates are, uh, you know, are, are complete. The most important thing in supporting estimates is this. You want to document them. Demonstrate they're common to the industry. Keep in mind that we're talking about fair value in a lot of cases here. Fair value market participants, okay? So fair value, the price that would be received to sell an asset. By who? As somebody, a market participant would purchase it. They would have their own unique assumptions. So those common to the industry. Uh, more importantly is this one, supportable. And the mechanics, this is what I often ask clients. This is a great assumption, okay? You're gonna grow. You're gonna have 15% growth or 20% growth. How are you gonna get there? Then there's usually that very uncomfortable silence. Okay, well, <laughs> how did that happen? Well, well, well I multiplied it by 1.05. It's like, well, well, no, how? So this is the narrative I would like. This is the narrative that makes me wanna reach for that cigarette and just put my feet back, okay? It's like this, in year one, we're gonna go from one million in sales to 1.5 million in sales. Point one, we're going to hire an additional 10 sales staff. Those 10 sales staff will be working in uh, five different provinces, uh, and the assumption is that each of those sales staff will generate 50 leads each, 50% of which are uh, result in positive results. So once again, is it plausible? Who knows? Let's deal with that later. The key thing, though, is at least it's a narrative. At least it's a narrative. So when Guy says to me, so Mark, what do you think? And I could say, well, guy, they arrived at that growth by multiplying it by 1.05. Okay, it doesn't pass. The narrative is so important. Tied into the facts, and by the way, if the facts don't exist, look harder. If the facts don't exist, look harder because you probably haven't found them. Here's the typical thing, okay? Well, we're trying, to, we're, trying to, we're trying to do an impairment test and we're trying to come up with a gross margin that's reflective of market participants' growth margin. How might we get that? We have no idea. Why don't you just Google six large competitors, see what their MD&As are, see what they disclose with respect to gross margins. Those competitors would be the market participants. Put a little memo together that says, here's six competitors, here's their margins, and here we go. We have some facts that we're tying it into. Is it plausible? That's a different story. But once again, look harder. And free of bias. How do you how do you remain free of bias? By at least presenting the whole range of alternatives. Just a couple minutes here. Oh, the second subliminal message that I told my daughter I didn't insert, identify bias. Be internally consistent, tie back to the facts, and consider sensitivities. So, good disclosure once again, describes the issue, the areas affected, why it's relevant, how it was resolved, the support, and the alternatives considered. Think back to that first example with that client that gave me that. He told me the whole narrative, why it mattered, what he did, what he considered, and why he chose what he did. Just a wonderful experience. The takeaway, we're in the home stretch, folks, here. Look at this, hey, I can see those beers are being cracked, the wine's poured. Where's the chocolate cake? We're almost there. Why do we ask the questions we do? Because we have to, particularly with the new, uh, the new standard. We have to, okay? Characteristics of well-supported judgments, in the words of Dagobert, hesitancy in judgment is the true mark of the thinker. Document your judgment. Demonstrate that you understand the business, that you understand the mechanics. Detail it, put enough details in there, and have a good, wholesome discussion that shows this is what it is, this is what we considered, this is what the impacts is, and these are what the other sensitivities are. 
And lastly, good disclosures. What constitutes a good disclosure? It distinguishes between the judgments, IAS 122, and estimates, IAS 125. Clearly explains the judgments made and their effects in the financials. Contains key sources of estimation uncertainty. And by key sources, what I mean is one or two or three. In fact, when you look at some good financial statements, they don't disclose a lot of information. They'll disclose two or three key uh, estimates that will end up impacting the carrying value if, in fact, you, you, you tweak those. And lastly, includes sensitivities and ranges of income. Excuse me, ranges uh, of outcomes. And I think that about does it.